Welcome back to the Cross Board Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 13, Dan McLean. Dan, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me, Chris. So, Dan, I'm going to start off my interview with you the same way I start off with all the city council candidates. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, way back when I was a teenager, my father was a teacher, grew up on a farm, but he ran when I was about 12, 13 years old. He ran for the nomination for the progressive conservatives back in the day. So I was kind of, you know, just a kid, like I said, but he had uh, his slogan was gain with McLean. And it was very exciting for me because you had the signs and the, you know, some rallies and speeches and stickers and the t-shirts. And so I got a real kick out of that. I knew I liked politics then, but uh, he lost the nomination by 20 votes. And, you know, it, and I was crushed. I was crying. And I was saying to Pops, I said, uh, he said, you know, son, it's not such a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing because I'm a young man. I've got the farm to take care of. I've got my career as a teacher, a beautiful wife and family. Maybe I'll wait till later on when I've got a little better perspective, some more, you know, experience under my belt. Now, we never did. But, you know, it's something then, I guess, it kind of always stuck with me. So, you know, I also raised a family as a young man, had my business career. And when I sold the company a couple of years ago, wondering what was I, what was going to be the next chapter, too young to retire. But I thought politics, now is the time for me to give back and to serve. So I ran my company. The head office was here in Calgary. I love this city. Um, like I said, sold the company, the kids are growing up out of the house and what better way to go to get back to the city and the community that has been so good to me was to serve. So uh, I guess that's, uh, you know, you watch a lot of politics, TV, news, you read, is nothing the same as once you kind of get involved. And so what I did first, Chris, is I volunteered on several campaigns. Um, just to see what this was all about, to see the inner workings of sausage making, one might say. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. And I figured, yeah, I can do this. It's maybe one of the worst times to get into the you know, politics. Very polarizing, a lot of anger, a lot of people with uh, behind keyboards. <laughs> but uh, I've chosen to do this, and yeah, and I'm having a blast. Well, and I want to talk about some of your policies, which are you can find on your website, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. But I want to also ask, there's many ways to give back to your community. Like you said, volunteerism is one of them. But you've chosen to go the political route. You've talked a little bit about it there, about how polarizing it is now. Why get into it now when politics is such a polarizing thing? I'll give you three reasons. Trudeau, Notley, and Nancy. <laughs> and seriously, I was looking back and I was not happy or I did not agree with the policies of those three politicians. And you can sit and yell and scream at the TV or you can get involved and do something about it. So um, again, I volunteered for some campaigns. The Leslie Lewis was one of my favorites, huge favorites. She was running for the federal uh, conservative party leadership. I met her a couple of years ago when I was first considering a run municipally and she came out to Calgary and, uh, and I said, here's this brilliant woman that I think could lead our, the conservative party to victory and uh, worked really hard out here in uh, Calgary, you know, helped run her Western Canadian campaign. She flew me out to Toronto to finish that up. So it was a big learning experience there. And then as well as Jazz Rash, Alon and another uh, Stephanie Cousy, some federal politicians from Calgary here. I think I have a few of their buttons behind me right now. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Oh, I see you've got quite the collection. Just a tad. But yeah. we, we talk about politics today. You have decided to get involved municipally. Municipal politics is the frontline politics of any politics. Federally, you go to Ottawa. Provincially, you're up in Edmonton. But here, municipally, it's City Hall. How do you believe your background as a business leader, as someone who's given back to the community, will help you be a successful counselor in your first term? All right. Well, see that, you know, just got to get to continue on by looking at the federal and provincial levels. You do a lot of travel. 
you are you've got a party whip and you're following uh most most likely party lines and platforms whereas municipally again that's why it appealed to me so much because you are one voice you know of 14 councillors and a mayor but you're representing your own backyard so to me now and then you don't have to compromise some of your beliefs because you don't have a party saying today this is our talking points toe the line so i will uh number one work just for the residents and how maybe i you to ask your question for municipal politics how i think that could be effective in this ward i know this area extremely well so i was uh, like i said born and raised in camrose started my company on a off my acreage just between camrose and edmonton uh, I've got the distribution rights for easy go golf cars for all of Alberta and BC. Oh, wow. And it turns out Calgary is the pretty much the hub for the golf car industry, you know, for, you know, lots of different like, titleists and but for the golf cars, especially so I uh, got an acreage down here in southwest Calgary, which, which is, uh, it's now called Silverado. At the time, it was just, you know, just acreages. And so we uh, branched there and then eventually to Vancouver. But uh, so you ran your business from this area. You raised your kids. You went to the theaters here. You got to know all the business owners and you know exactly what, you know, the issues are that uh, affect these people. But we call it uh, Southeast in terminology of Calgary. Like there's the Northeast or the people that are downtown, but I'm a Southie. You know, my parents were, uh, my dad was, family that came over from Scotland, settled in Nanton, High River, Vulcan area, uh, you know, close to the mountains, the foothills. So I don't know if I identify more with this area. It's more, you know, cattle country, horse country, western. Um, yeah, I'd like, I, I identify with this area. I feel good here. I think I know the issues of the people. And I guess that's why I settled on municipal politics here. So I was going to ask this question later on, but you bring up a good point. If elected on October 18th, you'll be there to represent the people of your ward. You will be elected by the people of your ward, but you will have to make decisions on a city level. You are not just there to represent only the people of Ward 13, but also represent everyone in the city of Calgary. How do you see yourself balancing the needs of Ward 13 with the needs and wants of all Calgarians? Well, first, we've got to get along. What I've seen again over the last couple of cycles of municipally is a lot of dysfunction. They, a lot of arguing. They go behind closed doors in camera, and uh, there's a lot of uh, arguing, yelling. Either way, some dysfunction. So the first thing you do, or what I would want to do, Chris, I'm a team player. I'm a people person. We know we're going to have a new mayor. We're going to have a ton of new councillors because a lot of councillors aren't running, and other ones are past their best before date. So first things first is you're going to want to you know we develop relationships with these other counselors because you're right the issues in the belt line are going to be different than uh, they are in the northeast or as they are down here in the southwest so you get you build relationships with the people that uh you know the counselors you're going to be serving with and the mayor and there's going to be compromises but you at the same time you want to be a loud voice for your ward some you know you don't want to be the council that sits back like a backbencher and just kind of let's <laughs> you know the other people make the decisions i want to have, have a very strong voice for ward 13 because i don't think they've had one for a very long time which is a good jumping off point because one of the key priorities that you've mentioned on your website is term limits you believe that term limits should be imposed or a policy should be passed to uh stop sort of the ongoing cycle of people being elected time and time again why do you believe term limits are so needed in municipal politics today well you, the key word there uh, chris is municipal because there's not you know two parties there's no parties so on a municipal level you'll have the incumbent and up to 10 people running right and right now i think we've got 15 going for mayor um, in a lot of wards, six, seven, eight. So what you end up with is a lot of vote splitting. And that's why term limits. So in, uh, you'll see people, ward seven, ward 13, other wards where incumbents are winning with, you know, less than a third of the vote. It's not exactly an overwhelming mandate of support. So with a term limit, at least. So again, the advantage is <clears throat> fully, uh, they, they're, they're stacked in the favor of an incumbent that can just stay there over and over and over again again, without even close majority support. So that's why I think term limits are so important there. 
because I don't want to impose party politics or you know slates at the municipal level, but change is good. Fresh ideas and new blood is a good idea. And I'm not saying that I don't know if we can make it legal, but anybody that campaigns on term limits, like you know the. <laughs> So the people that have campaigned on term limits and then they don't abide by them should be, you know, that should be recognized and maybe uh, you're not being reelected. So, uh, but, but making it part of your platform, you should stand by what you say. So I'm going to ask the question, what is your term limit? Is it two terms, three terms? What is the number for you? For me, it's two. two? So the Eight. first term, I'm going to really get to know what I'm doing. And again, with a business background, you know, alluding to your earlier question, you know, having a background in business, I think, and running, you know, three branches and, you know, good times, bad times, good seasons, bad seasons. You, you learn how to budget. You know what a, a P&L statement looks like or a balance sheet. So you bring that to, to the table. You learn. And then, uh, and I guess, and this administration does a lot of the uh, heavy lifting, I think, at the municipal level. So you've got to find out um, there's going to be a big, steep learning curve. The second term, you really figure out what you're doing. You click it on all cylinders. You know, I wouldn't, I, the third term would be, I think, possible, but I'm not for other people, but for myself, then I think then that's eight years. I'm not a spring chicken. If I want to serve, I might then look at something else in a different capacity or a different level. Perfect. Um, we'll get to some policy now because policy comes from the people that you're there to represent. Um, you are campaigning and if you're not knocking on doors uh, i'm assuming you're you're going to be starting here soon but i i'm going to assume that you are knocking on doors and talking to the citizens of ward 13. what are you hearing from them what are you hearing from them that needs to change at city hall good question so i started over a year ago i knew that i was going up against a long-term incumbent and to avoid the vote, vote splitting i wanted to make a strong presence so there's uh, over 100,000 people, 40 some thousand homes. And so my first round was dropping literature and we were in a pandemic. So dropping literature with a survey on it and they can be called back and I'd reply and you get a lot of concerns that way. And also of course, talking to people that are outdoors and you can talk to them while they're in their garden or shoveling their walk. Uh, so th that was the first cycle. The second one now was door to door, which again, I've pretty much gone around every door again, knocking on the doors, again, listening to the concerns social media posts, again, collecting that data. So roundabout long question, um, top concerns, number one, businesses and residents are their taxes. There's uh, been a current city council and mayor have, they've been on a spending spree and there's only one way to pay for that is then to tax people. You can't run deficits at the municipal level. You can only shift it over to uh, the residents and businesses or find new creative ways to tax people. And they've done all of these things. So that's number one. And strangely enough, and this is not being not in the you know, order of priority, but a dog park. Ward 13 does not have a dog park right now. We had one good one that was got wiped out when, uh, with a ring road expansion or construction. And so we were just working on kind of a you know, social media post on that today because I hear that all the time. I'm a dog lover, ton of dog owners, pet owners, and they don't have a dog park for years now. So that's a big one. Um, other ones would be... Would be, of course, like I said, the fighting and behind camera sessions of council. Uh, another big one would be spending. You know, there, there's a lack of consultation on big issues. You know, if it wasn't for a couple councillors, we'd be having an Olympics right now in the middle of a pandemic. You know, we can't afford coming up on oil cr uh, prices crashing. They got it right that time under tremendous pressure to go to the people in a plebiscite. So I think that's important. Sometimes you should ask your people, and I'll regularly be polling my, my residents and constituents to find out what they, you know, on big issues. But uh, so spending, like whether it's the arena or art projects or the uh, green line, those are all big issues. Um, another one was snow removal. So they had, we had a massive storm. Guess what? It snowed in Calgary this year. And what? I didn't I didn't see that this year. <laughs> yeah, council wasn't quite prepared for that one. <laughs> and so we did snow to get removed for weeks on fun end if people were trapped in their cul-de-sacs. So there's got to be a faster, more efficient way of delivering services. Uh, crime is actually on the rise uh, in some places, too. So you know, law enforcement and speed enforcement, you know, those kind of things, Chris. You know, there's a lot of them right down to, um, um, you know, some daily concerns. But I think those are some of the top ones. 
one area that I want to focus in on just those topics that you just talked about was fiscal responsibility. It is key words on your website, fiscal responsibility. Um, taxes is the main one I want to focus on right now. Um, as a business owner, a former business owner, and as a business owner myself, the cost of services go up. You know that everyone everyone is under the understands that cost of businesses business goes up. Inflation happens. How do you see working with your other 15 council members, including yourself, to ensure that taxes stay low, but also ensuring that while businesses go up, you're not slashing and cutting potential services that people need? Yeah, that's a tough one because it is a delicate balance. You know, and, you know, taxes are inevitable, just like death, as they say. <laughs> so and people, you know, at the doors, a lot of people say, I don't mind paying taxes. I don't even mind small increases. Just spend my money wisely. So that's the key. If you can show them where it's at, you say, you know what? We just can't afford another $300 million library right now. You know, things like that. There, and some, you know, art, we all love art, but maybe we can find, uh, you know, source it locally, and maybe not being a huge art aficionado, I don't know if it was worth 10 million or 10 bucks, but let's get some nice art, but let me not break the bank at it. And some projects we just can't afford, you know, and some one of those might be the green line where, you know, we've got to see a clear budget. Let's see where the money's going. We just can't go ahead and we, we have to build this now because we're going to get matching funds from the province or from the federal government. I mean, this, you know, buy, get, buy one, get one free, you know, argument. If we got to buy, we're going to save money. You know, we want to create jobs. We need to provide services. But again, every one of these issues have to be looked through with the lens of can we afford it? What are the residents, uh, the demand for it? And, uh, you know, and as our you know, infrastructure needs to be done, but I guess I'll look at each one of those things each issue through the lens of fiscal responsibility and again uh, consulting your residents and working with other city councillors as well again I, i'm not going to be serving on an island here i know the rest of the city needs uh, uh, to be served as well but uh, again not an easy answer there chris and i appreciate you you being honest and being open to answering the question because the one thing that i've seen since moving to calgary in the last few uh, years is the number of for sale signs that are going up, your tax base is leaving because the taxes are increasing. You have stated on your website yet again, which is danmcclain.ca, uh, which will be linked in the show notes, um, that you are for a forensic audit of the municipal budget, the $4 billion municipal budget. Why do you think that is so important moving into the future? Well, yeah, $4 billion. Um, huge amount of money. I think what happens is that a lot of people, especially when you're in politics, and I've talked to, polit to politicians at different levels, and again, the longer you're there, you're passing $100 million, $10 million, bill, you know, all these huge dollar amounts, and you kind of lose sight of what you know that is. I mean, what's the dollar worth? So uh, as far as a forensic audit, and this has been done before, and it will cost some money as well, but uh, it's more of a deep dive into each department's spending. And so where I think the savings can be found, Chris, and again, a lot of this comes from just doing some research and talking to people that a transit driver, he, he came into the op campaign office. And so you know, he kind of explains, we've got the small bus, we've got the big bus, we've got the train and you know, what their salaries are. And these are the frontline workers and we need those guys. They need to be paid the same as the guy removing your snow, the policemen, the fire firemen or, uh, all those frontline services, all these things need to be done. But where I find, he says, I've got then a foreman and then a shop foreman and then a manager on top of that. Like there seems to be six or seven layers of administration between that guy that's doing the hard work and then the city council is going to vote on it. And, and I've heard of many stories where they say, you know, there's three people in that office, you know, put some paper around. And you know, there's an example, I think it was in the council from Ward 10, where they had a whole staff over there that were submitting bills. They didn't do anything for a year, if I remember that story correctly. So let's get in and just find out and say, are, is this job necessary? I mean, you don't want to be the slash and burn guy. And I don't want the union saying, hey, this guy wants to break and crush unions. No, we want fair pay. We want everybody to have jobs. But there's some place if, that we just can't afford you and you're not necessary, or it's just another added layer of bureaucracy. 
because this seems to be where we're going these days at all levels of government. The government just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't ever seem to shrink. And once they get these jobs in place you know, or more powers, they never want to relinquish it and give it back to the people. So this is where you've got to find and dig in there. And again, it's not going to go in there with a hatchet and say you're fired. You might have to lose some jobs through attrition, but we have to look at the, the administration out of that $4 billion. I think this is where, you know, hiring freeze too, a wage freeze, these things. I'll lead by example too. I mean, politicians shouldn't be in it for the money or, you know, pensions is another big one. I mean, there's some, you know, huge pensions, double pensions. So let's, let's lead by example and let's just see where we can find the savings. And that's, I think, where we find it in the, in the management and that. One one thing that I've heard from residents from across the city that I've spoken to is pensions, pensions for city council, actual city councillors, um, the double dipping, the two pensions for some, the transition allowance. Would that be an area that you would potentially want to look at if elected on October 18th of getting rid of, rid of pensions because Alberta politicians don't have it, uh, municipal politicians do. Is it an area that you'd be willing to look at, even what the salary is for the city council councillors in whole, as a whole? Well, you certainly everything should be on the table, and uh, you know, back in the days of Ralph Klein, he led you know by example with some big <laughs> you know <laughs> some you know some cuts. So, uh, I guess two thoughts on that, Chris: the golden handshake. You know, that's that's a no-brainer. That's got to go. And so, city council looked at that. It looks like they're ending it. It turns out like nobody even know how it originated in the first place. I've seen you know, people digging in to find out how did this originate, and we can't find out how it did. So I think they're ending it, but it's not ending right now. It's, it's going to be phased out. But yeah, no, no, that should just boom gone. Pensions, you know, same thing. Double pensions, triple pensions in some cases. Like the mayor, yeah, no, you don't need those. But as far as wages, I mean, a salary and a pension. Now I'm not going to say that you have to cut those completely. For one reason only. So I think a city councilor makes $110,000, $15,000 a year. It's not a huge salary, should be not a bad salary. Um, you know, if there's people maybe in the police force and fire department or the city administration certainly making more than that. Uh, and so my point is if you want to you know, recruit somebody, a good talent, you can't ask them to work for free. You know, if the teacher, the nurses, again, there's a lot of people in the old days that was a doctor's salary. You know, when I was growing up. Now I think it's a competitive salary. Remember, this is a job that um, if you do your job, you're working 80 hours a week. I know, and I've talked to a lot of people and politicians and the ones that are working hard, I mean, they're, they're putting in, like sometimes city council uh, Mondays themselves or a lot of these meetings, you know, they'll, they'll go wrap around the clock. So you want, if you're gonna work 80 hours a week and you, then you're, work, you're doing all your work in the community constantly, and obviously you could get fired in four years. So it's not exactly someone that's going to leave a really high, you know, great career or great business to jump into if you tell them that they're going to have to work for nothing. Can't go. <laughs> so there's a balance there as well. You know, it's got to be fair, but it, you know, at the same time, we certainly don't need any raises. And like I said, the double pensions and the gold handshakes, for sure, that's, that's, a, that's a no brainer. Those got to go. One of the biggest topic on everyone's mouth these days is COVID-19. COVID-19 and the recovery. We are hoping people are getting the vaccines. People, uh, we're opening up. We're having the best summer ever, as Jason Kenney has stated. How does the city ensure that all Calgarians move forward and recover together? How do we ensure that we don't leave anyone else, anyone behind in the recovery process? Because People are struggling right now. I think you probably hear this as well as I do, but people are struggling. How do we ensure that we in help them and help everyone out of this global pandemic, but also help the people who have been struggling since the economic downturn five, 10 years ago? Yeah, and that's squarely on small business. We really have to focus and support them. What I've seen during this pandemic is the rich get richer, the big corporations, people in government, you know, airlines. I mean, there's a thousand stories about, you know, there's billions upon billions of money that's been dispersed that didn't make it down to the people. Very, very poorly. You know, I understand it's a pandemic. We've got to help. Um, in hindsight, we're going to look back and find out how much is not made for the people or, had, or, or straight up fraud. So going forward, 
uh, I would love to see the city be on the same page with the province because this we are listening to the provincial. This is a provincial mandate, and again, everybody should stay in their corners. The municipal, the provincial, the federal, and not to detract from COVID, but a quick example: the federal government today just uh, made it illegal to have a uh, gay conversion therapy. Now. I agree with that. that's fine you know i don't know how, how prevalent it is but that's a, that's a straight up federal issue but last year or maybe two years ago the municipal government spent a lot of time and effort and money doing their own mandate on that it's not your mandate so stay within your wheelhouse so when it comes to uh, dr dina hinshaw that says the science now says with the vaccines and the rh transmission rates icu beds etc we can open up now and we see what's going down in, on down south with full arenas and full stadiums and hockey rinks. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, it should be the best <laughs> summer ever. Let's get it on. I want a stampede. Uh, I'm going to be having a stampede breakfast myself. I was optimistic that we would be here at this stage. So again, the city should follow the provincial guidelines on that. You know, and some certain things like I do agree with uh, for the short term. Short term, if you're on a tram on mass transit or in combined areas. Yeah, mascot. I mean, that's just polite because people, some don't want it, some do, but you're when you're confined, let's just be polite. But when you're outdoors and uh, if we're going to be moving forward, uh, these businesses need to fill up their restaurants. We need to fill up the bars. We need to fill up the stores, the small mom and pop stores. I'm tired of seeing Walmart and Home Depot raking in all the cash because we've all been there during the pandemic with the superstore where it's like wall to wall. And you got to go get some flowers for Valentine's <laughs> Day, but the poor florist over there can't make a buck. You know, that's that, that's just been unfairly targeting there. So I'm all for it. I think uh, uh, the science proves it, and the Dr. Dina Henshaw says we can open up July 1st. And in a perfect world, we don't look back. But I'm I'm optimistic. Is there any policy or anything that City Hall can do? itself to help the small businesses start reopening because we are we see the dysfunction with that within city council and we saw it just recently with the whole mask bylaw mandate are we extending it are we not extending it and the, it turns out we are extending it we're not allowing people to just not wear masks after july 1st it's now july 5th i think i don't know the exact date, uh, numbers so what can the city uh, city hall do to ensure that small businesses are being helped after this pandemic opens up, after we open up and everything gets back to quote unquote normal. Well, a key point you said there, Chris, again, was the mixed messaging. So that was a really bad move. And that's what I'm hearing from the businesses. I say They say now I can open up fully on July 1st and not have a mask. And then they're told by the mayor and some councillors are saying, no, 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 don't listen to them, listen to me. Uh, we got to wait to the fifth or maybe longer. And so that leaves the businesses. So clarity, clarity is a good thing. And again, sometimes I guess, again, maybe not sidestepping the question, but if we had a mayor and council that was maybe more aligned with our provincial, you know, and government or federal representatives, because we're kind of on the same page fighting for the same things, I think things would be smoother. Um, but uh, having said with the small business, I'm not about handouts. But support, support, support. So when it comes to the best way you can support small business right now is not by raising their taxes. Agreed. Um, I, 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 we're going to put on our hat here and imagine that you were elected on October 18th. You are the successful candidate. Priority number one for Dan McLean going into a new term. What is it? So priority number one is, like I said, getting along, meeting and greeting and finding and getting along with your fellow city councilors and the new mayor. That's just, that's just job one, because we have to work together for the city. We, after all, we're servants. We've got to make sure you break down, you know, the egos and it's not all about you and, you know, or your motion or who gets the airtime or what can, what wedge issue can I just put out there? So I get on TV tomorrow. I see a lot of that. It, you know, it really it upsets me sometimes. It's like, let's just take the news of the day and jump on before we get all the evidence. So let's just slow down sometimes and just get along. So that's job one, Chris. I mean, and I think nobody's even trying to do that right now and everything's so polarized. And maybe it's the political climate, maybe it's the, you know, the pandemic has a lot to do with it. But I've had a 
pretty successful life and getting along with people. You know, I'm, uh, I'll stand up for what's right, but let's get along and let's figure out what issues are best. So that's number one. Number two then is going to meet all the department heads in the administration, the city planner and the city manager. Um, again, find out their priorities because again, I'm gonna be new to this. I'm not gonna be, on, I'm surprised sometimes how many people jump in and say, I wanna do this job with little or no experience in, you know, in running a business or life experience or these things. Cause I do, I think it's gonna be daunting. I mean, I find it cause you know, I've imagined what you've said that I will be city councilor on October 18th. And what are you gonna do now? And yeah, it's gonna be, there's a, there's a lot of like uh, political rules. I mean, where, you know, the motions and the zoning. And so there's a lot of homework that needs to be done. I've been doing a fair amount of it already, but learning your ABCs. So that so th those are the key things, I guess, getting to the meat and potatoes of how the city you know, really run, who the key people and personnel are, and your coworkers to get along. After that, then uh, it's going to be Ward 13 residents concerns, which I've got a pretty good handle on already. And then, um, yeah, and after that, we just want to get this, we want jobs. We've got to get this whole city clicking again, ro rocking and rolling. I mean, we're the best city and the best province and the best country in the whole world. I mean, we've got it all. And this pessimism has to maybe end where everybody's at each other's throats and let's be all optimistic and let's just move forward together. So you just mentioned something. I want to jump on it for a second before we move on. Um, the city yet again is the best city in the pro best city in the best province in the best country in the world. But our city is up against other cities, Vancouver, Toronto, Edmonton, even down the States for attracting businesses to our community, uh, to our city. How do you envision the to to re reinvent the narrative that is Calgary? How do you envision Calgary being portrayed in the next four years? Well, right there, as one big kumbaya at City <laughs> Hall, you all get along. <laughs> you know, if I'm an investor or you know, big investment firm or business looking and say, I want to move here. And I see that there's a lot of fighting within the city and also the city fighting with the province because uh, like it or not, that's who's going to hold the purse strings. The money, you know, that they're doling out to distributing the money to the cities, you know, or health or education are controlled by the province. So those relationships have to be repaired because they're, I think they're pretty tattered right now. Um, so again, and also they can offer a lot of incentives to bring you know, it's tech. We, you know, tech is a big exploding industry. Our oil and gas, that's not going anywhere in the near future. But we've got, we can explore that with carbon capture and we've got hydrogen. We've got a billion dollar investment coming with some hydrogen, LNG, you know, all these things that we have to work in together. But uh, I guess the key there is in, you know, putting on a, a unified uh, position and so that an offer and some tax, you know, not necessarily tax incentives. Tax rates are good. The province, I think, we have, I think, the lowest tax uh, business tax rates, you know, anywhere. So we're going in the right direction there. Um, so again, working together and just making everything as attractive as possible to build a, to make show uh, business friendly. Now, the last set of questions I want to ask you is about the future. Why should you, Dan McLean, be the next city councilor? For Ward 13? I think I I have what it takes. I think I've again, you know, I'm not a spring chicken. I've had a pretty good career in business with family and just the natural, I guess, experience that you'll get in life by being around the block a couple of times or more. So uh, I'm gonna be dedicated. I had I don't, and I'm not gonna say that just you know, if you're younger or you have a family and those things, that shouldn't prohibit you from getting into politics. It really is a call to serve and you better take it seriously because this is a uh, you know you're serving the people and you're, you're they're taking your you and their their faith in you and uh, and their money but uh, having said that I've, all that's in the back of your mirror for me so my singular focus will be on doing the best job for this city you know day in and day out seven days a week um so that's i guess number one why i think um you know I, i'm I could have that time to serve. Uh, secondly, I guess that business background, like I said, where, you know, sometimes you've got to get, you know, 
kicked in the kahunas and being knocked down a few times to realize what life's all about. So when you're in business, and every business owner knows that, like 2008, 9, 10, when the financial markets crashed, that pretty much put me under. You know, all the big money, you know, you know, running my floor plans or your suppliers out of the States, they were crashing. And then all the deals, your supply chains were messed up. And you know, uh, so you, you learn how to adapt and you learn fiscal responsibility really quick. So you don't overextend yourself so that you're in a position where you, um, you, you can really be taken down and gone out of business. You know, business owners are unique in that way. They know they're the ones that get paid last or they've stayed up overnight figuring out how to make payroll or maybe putting stuff on a credit card. So you learn these things by, you know, life experience and running a business for all those years. So I think that's how, because uh, again, the, uh, the city is just a big business and uh, it should be run accordingly by a budget and adhere to. So those are the few things, I guess. Um, and... I don't know how long you want me to go on in this. How I think no, and, uh, and that, that's that's good. Job. But go uh, ahead. yeah, who, who knows? Maybe uh, hard, hard work. I guess that's the last part. Nothing is easy in life. And if in I guess, and I've told my kids this. I've kind of raised them to this thing. And you know, I had a brother that played professional football, and I had another brother that was the valedictorian, the smartest guy, and a sister who's just super duper at everything. I was one of these guys that was never, never great at excel at one thing, but I was good at a lot of things. And I tell the same to my kids. And I think that's just the way you've got to live your life. Just if you're good at a lot of things and then you can do. Um, and I think that's just another attribute I think that I have going forward and hopefully, uh, hopefully it serves me well in October. So uh, my last question for you is campaigns take volunteers, 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 volunteers. Uh, how can people get involved in your campaign? For the people of Ward 13 who are listening, how can they get involved in your campaign and reach out and talk to you directly and ask you more questions like these? Well, the website has got all the information. If you want to lawn sign you on your danmcclain.ca, uh, email patrick at danmcclain.ca, phone number 403-248 or 403-295-406. I was looking over the wall at my side, but we can't. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. 403-295-4064. You call the campaign office. Again, this was fairly unique. I decided to do this early, um, get a campaign office. I found some really, really, uh, long story I don't have to tell now. But we're here every morning, and then afternoon, then I go door to door to door, and then in the evening, we do some other work. Um, but get a hold of me. Right now, we're getting, uh, I'm just... Uh, humbled by the overwhelming support that we're getting with the lawn signs and the big signs and the volunteers. You get a free t-shirt and a hat. I mean, come on, it's, <laughs> come on down. Even a button, we've got campaign buttons. <laughs> I will take one. I will be down to help volunteer so I can get a button from you. <laughs> yeah, and, and the website, of course, just danmcclain.ca. Google my name, you'll find me. There's a lot of social media. You can follow me, of course, on Facebook. Twitter, LinkedIn, things, but uh, the Google machine works. But I, you know what I found, Chris, a lot of people you know, just don't want to use the phone. So give us a call. For sure. And for my listeners and to my viewers, uh, the link to Dan's Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, his website and his uh, email address will be in the show notes. So I highly recommend that you follow him, get out, get involved, talk to Dan if you want to get involved, talk to Dan if you want to vote for him, if you want to volunteer, I highly recommend that you do that. Dan, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I know we're about the 40 minute mark right now, so I don't want to keep you much longer, but thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. This is a lot of fun. I really appreciate it.